Well, here we are. We're getting ready to head into round two of the IHSA state playoffs and the quarterfinals of the I8FA playoffs. And uh, obviously taking a look at things on the NUIC side uh, in the um, NUIC itself, the 11-man conference, we had all five teams move into the second round of the playoffs, which is excellent for the conference in itself. Um, it was projected to be that way as well. Uh, so it, it's, it was a perfect weekend, to say the least, for the NUIC. On the eight-man side, uh, the conference in general did go 3-1, and one, but if you take a look at the North 2 division, where the primary focus of our eight-man teams reside, that division did go 3-0 and as Polo, Amboy, and Milledgeville all passed the test in the first round to reach the quarterfinal round uh, for uh, the second year in a row uh, that we've seen all three of these teams advance to this position. So um, very, very good games over the course of the weekend. Um, obviously, there were other games that were definitely blowouts. We'll take a look at what we had in the first round in the eight-man division. And uh, moving into the quarterfinals, we have Decatur Lutheran as they beat Martinsville 86-54. to St. Thomas Moore beat Pawnee 52-8. to uh, Milford Cisna Park beat AFC 70-24. to Amboy beat Blue Ridge 48 to nothing. West Central passed South Beloit. 72 to 16. Milledgeville beat West Prairie 52 to 3. Ridgewood beat South Fork 58 to 26. And Polo beat Hiawatha 44 to 8. So, I mean, taking a look at those scores, some of the games that we thought would be close would be number 8, St. Thomas Moore versus Pawnee. And then a number 6, Polo versus number 11, Hiawatha. And actually, those games were two of our biggest blowouts that we saw in, in first round action. So, um, Obviously, the top eight in the IHFA are exactly where uh, we thought that they would be. They're all sitting here ready to go for this quarterfinal matchup, and it should be a very good one to take a look at. Obviously, we'll break down our expectations uh, with these teams that are on our docket coming up, of which we'll be covering three of the four games that we have on slate this week. Uh, moving into Class 1A, we saw the Lena Winslow Panthers take care of Chicago Richards 48-6. to That game was 34 to nothing after the first quarter, uh, at, and at that moment, the teams agreed to have a running clock and then move to eight-minute quarters in the second half, so that's why... You didn't see such a large score discrepancy as originally expected from Lena Winslow as they were a 64-point uh, favorite in that game, um, or a 61-point favorite, something like that. But uh, either way, it did not transpire because they agreed to uh, keep the clock moving and limit uh, game clock time. Uh, Fulton gets past Aurora Christian 38-13. to uh, we saw Forston get the upset of St. Bede 46 to 22. And then we watched Dakota get the upset of Iroquois West 16 to 14. And that was an interesting game. Dakota committed four first half turnovers, got themselves down 14 to nothing, um, which was seven to nothing at halftime, and then they gave up a touchdown within the first minute of the third quarter, and then they battled their way all the way back to score two touchdowns in the third and fourth quarter collectively to take the 16 to 14 win and set up a second round rematch with uh, the Marquette Crusaders, which will be the uh, second or third time these two teams have met. This will be the third time, at least, that they've met in the second round. I know that they met up in 2015, or 2016, I mean, and then they met up again in 2018. So since 2016, this will definitely be the third time these two teams have met in the second round of the playoffs, um, each team going one and one thus far. So that takes us over to the 3A bracket where we saw 
the Dupec Rivermen come out with a 52 to 8 win over Catalyst Maria. Again, another CPL team uh, just wasn't expected to be uh, much of a game, and it, it showed that with the final score as well. Um, but in either case, we continue to move on. Um, if you take a look at that 1A bracket in the North Division, uh, Lena Wenzel will pair up with Rova Williamsfield, who beat Stark County 28-14. to Fulton is going to take on Rockford Lutheran, who beat Anawan Weathersfield 35-19. to Forston is going to play host to Chicago Hope, who beat Chicago Corliss 69 to nothing, And Dakota is going to play host to Ottawa Marquette as the Marquette Crusaders beat Morrison 20-6. Uh, down on the south end, Ridgeview Lexington moves on 47-14 over Madison. Salt Fork uh, will be their opponent with a 48-31 win over Red Hill. Tuscola edges one out with Brown with Brown County 20 to 18. They will play host to Route, who beat Villa Grove 41 to 15. Camp Point Central moves on with a 66 to nothing win over Dupo as they play host to Cesar Valier, who beat Central A&M 49 to 12. Greenfield Northwestern came out with a 38 to 7 win over Calhoun, and they are going to play host to Cumberland, who. Beat Rushville 34 to 8. Uh, in Class 3A, uh, as expected, Princeton beats Piatone 56 to 28, and they are going to play host to Genoa Kingston, who beat Elmwood Brimfield 16 to 8. IC Catholic moves on with a 63 to nothing win over CPL opponent Chicago King. Stillman Valley will be their opponent as they beat Monmouth Roseville 48 to 33. Uh, this will be the fourth time. That Stillman Valley, no, fifth time that Stillman Valley and IC Catholic meet up in the playoffs. IC Catholic is 3 and 1 in their previous contest. Reed Custer gets the 77 24 win over CPL opponent Chicago Carver. They are going to play host to Dupec. Seneca with a 48 20 win over Winnebago. And they're going to play host to the defending champion Byron Tigers, who beat Lyle 52 7. Down in the south bracket, Prairie Central moves on with a 57 12 win over PBL. They are going to go on the road to Roxana, who beat Hillsboro in an upset 13 7. Tolono Unity uh, moves on with a 21 0 win over Harrisburg. They are going to play host to Mount Carmel, who beat Tolono Unity's conference rival Monticello 8 6. Uh, Stanford Olympia, the Olympia Spartans, get the upset of Benton 32 21. They are going to play host to St. Joseph Ogden, who beat Robinson 55 39. Uh, Williamsville moves on with a 48 to 20 win over Carlinville, and they are going to play host to Eureka, who beat Beardstown 49 to six. Uh, in Class 2A, obviously we don't have any teams that we cover there uh, left remain, but we'll just go through the bracket real fast. Moroa Forsyth beats L North Lawndale Charter out of the CPL 69-8. They are going to play host to Farmington, who beat El Paso Gridley 40-30. Uh, Rockridge gets a 42-12 win over Conference foe Newman Central Catholic. They are going to go on the road to Bloomington to play Central Catholic, who beats Mercer County 27-26 in overtime. Uh, Bismarck Henning moves on with a 43-35 win over Conference rival Westville. They are going to play host to Knoxville, who beat Menden Unity 33-14. Wilmington gets a 41-7 win over Chicago Christian. They will play host to Tri-Valley, who beat Clifton Central 44-0. Uh, St. Teresa gets a 49-0 win over Chester. They will go on the road to Athens, who beat White County 48-8. Pena beats Auburn 59-30. They are going to... Uh, go on the road to Fairfield to the train yard where they'll play uh, the Mules who upset North Mac 20 to 19. Johnston City moves on to 36 to 21 over conference foe Flora and they are going to go on the road to Arthur uh, to play Arthur Lovington Atwood Hammond who upset Vandalia 41 to 34. Belleville Altoff gets the upset over uh, Shelbyville 38 to 34 
and they will play host to Red Bud, who beat Nashville 34 to 21. So that gives you a look at what the brackets are uh, from eight man to class 3A. And we're going to go in and break down each of our games for the NUIC right now. All right, we're going to start in eight man where the Amboy Clippers are going to travel down to Milford to play Milford Cisna Park. This is a rematch of the week four matchup that Milford Cisna Park won 40 to 30. Amboy beat Blue Ridge last week 48 to nothing, and MCP moves on with a 70 to 24 win over AFC. Uh, despite the loss back in week four, Amboy has played themselves. Uh, back into a five-point favorite in this game. They were the favorite the last time these two teams met up, in which MCP uh, did get the win. Both teams lost key players in that game, uh, with Mason Blank for MCP going out and Tucker Lindemeyer going out for Amboy. And the good thing is for both these squads, both these players do return, so this should be a another uh, premier matchup uh, in the quarterfinals to see who can move on. Um, obviously, Amboy was a semifinalist a year ago. Uh, MCP lost in a shootout in the quarterfinals to Polo a season ago. MCP very familiar with uh, getting far in the playoffs as they were the 2018 uh, state champions and kind of a diluted eight-man at the time. But then they did get back to the state championship game in 2019 when more teams uh, joined the field and uh, were runner-up to Polo that year. Um, obviously, playing at home is definitely going to favor MCP in this matchup uh, to, a, to a slight degree. But as I stated, Amboy is a five-point favorite in this game. You take a look at some of the uh, players that will be uh, featured in this game. and. Uh, for the Clippers, they've gotten a big play and huge productivity out of Landon Welchel, who's up to 1,034 yards rushing on the year. Um, and uh, you take a look at uh, some other key players. Quinn Luffelman uh, is at 552 yards rushing uh, with uh, nine touchdowns. Obviously, getting uh, Tucker Lindemeyer back is going to be a huge asset. For Amboy, um, he did return last week. He's up to 615 yards passing on 64% completion percentage with nine touchdowns to just two interceptions. His leading target is Brennan Blaine. Uh, Brennan has 917 yards receiving with 16 touchdowns, which um, leads all uh, area teams and uh, pretty close to leading the entire eight man. I'm pretty sure in that category as well with that 28.7 uh, yard per reception average. 16 touchdowns through the air for Mr. Blaine as well. Defensively, obviously we've talked about it over and over. That defense is going to be uh, led uh, by the defensive ends, which are Leffelman and um, Blaine. Uh, and then, of course, you take a look at Everything else that Amboy has going on, many playmakers on the defensive side of the ball that can uh, wreak havoc for these boys. Um, obviously, MCP will be led by Mason Blank. You got Chase Clatour, uh, Sawyer Lafoon, and, and a host of others. Uh, and, you know, it, this is going to be one of those games that's going to be very physical. Um, as I've stated before, if you're not a fan of eight-man football uh, or, or you don't know much about eight-man football, um, this would definitely be a key matchup to watch. Obviously, up here, it'd be harder for people to get down to Milford to see that game, uh, as it is quite, quite a journey from up in our area. But uh, um, definitely one of those games that you would want to watch, especially if you're down in the central Illinois area. Um, my pick on the game, I have Amboy winning 34 to 29 in a rematch. 
All right, our next game is going to take us to Cambridge, where the Ridgewood Spartans enter this game 9-1. They will play host to Polo, the two-time defending state champions, who enter this game at 8-2. and two. Last week, Polo beat Hiawatha 44-8 to in a rematch. Ridgewood beat South Fork 58-26. to um, You take a look at uh, what these two teams have done as far as body of work. This is Ridgewood's first year in eight-man football. Here they are in the quarterfinals in year one. Having a successful year, they've only got the one blemish on the season to West Central, who has uh, run amok with everybody that they've played uh, and have earned that number one ranking, rightfully so, for their work. But uh, taking a look at this one, obviously uh, um, Polo is going to come in with a – as a 15-point favorite in this game, you take a look at strength of schedule. It definitely favors Polo over Ridgewood. Uh, Polo has played uh, five playoff opponents, run into a 3-2 and two record. Ridgewood has done the same, but they have a 4-1 and one record. Taking a look at scoring deferential uh, against playoff opponents, it's about the same. But when you take a look at the strength of schedule difference, that's where I put it. I throw in a little multiplier. Uh, effect to kind of offset the balance uh, between the two and uh, you know this game uh, has the capabilities of being close you take a look at um, who leads the team for polo and that is obviously the leading rusher for the Marcos which is Brock Solto who has 1,879 yards and 30 touchdowns Obviously, Ridgewood is going to counter that with Gavin McDonough, who has 1,502 yards on the ground with 21 touchdowns. And then they also have Roy Sandberg, who's up to 823 yards rushing with 11 touchdowns. Um, Polo does have Avery Grenoble, uh, who was out last week on the season. He has 897 yards and 13 touchdowns. Don't know if his return will be back. Uh, in this game, but Delo Fernandez did step up with a very good game himself last week, running for 163 yards um, on the season. He has 241 yards and two touchdowns. So, you know, Polo obviously is very accustomed to deep playoff runs. Um, so far in uh, the eight man playoffs, they are 9 and 0 uh, since joining eight man back in 2019. Uh, so, Experience wise, to have it. Obviously, on the other side of the ball, you have Coach Pat Elder. Uh, and, and, you know, Coach Elder has a good uh, feel for football, um, has been able to pick up on the eight man game relatively fast as the season has rolled on. You know, I can expect this game to be a good one. Obviously, it's going to chew up some clock. Uh, at the same time, I have to lean to experience, and with that, I have Polo picked as my favorite, 50 to 24. All right, our next game is going to take us to Bigsville, where the number one ranked West Central Heat enter this game at 10 and 0. They are going to take on the number six ranked Milledgeville Missiles, who enter the game at 8 and 2. Last week, Milledgeville beat West Prairie 52 to 3, and West Central beat South Beloit 72 to 16. This is another uh, rematch where uh, West Central. One in week seven, 64 to 36. The biggest question in this game is, have the missiles learned how to set the edge on defense? And the reason for that is because um, West Central is basically able to take control of this game simply by running an option offense to the outside edge and then being able to beat Milledgeville to the edge. And that allowed Drosty to get down the sideline uh, a lot in this game as he ran for 374 yards and five touchdowns to help pace the heat. And then later on in the game, Mason Carnes kind of took over as well, along with Parker Meldrum, as they did most of the work in the second half of this game. Um, obviously, West Central has uh, obliterated the, the playoff competition that they face, averaging 65 points per game against all playoff opponents. Uh, in the regular season, 
while only allowing 30 points per game. So their their scoring differential is uh, in favor of them by plus 35 points per game. Uh, whereas Milledgeville has gone three and three against playoff opponents, and that was uh, two and three in the regular season. Arguably faced the toughest schedule uh, of all playoff opponents when you take a look at um, the amount of top ranked teams that they had to play on their schedule um, as they played Polo, Amboy, uh, West Central. They also uh, played Decatur Lutheran as well. So they, they, they've they definitely played uh, four of the top six teams. And obviously they're part of that top six. So for the other five teams that are ranked in the top six, they've played on their schedule this season. So um, Milledgeville is definitely battle-tested. Uh, did face some injuries that have hurt them. Obviously, Bryce Audie's back uh, definitely helps lead to some better things for the Missiles as far as what they can do. Colton Wilk is back in the lineup as well. Um, but is it going to be enough to offset... Uh, the impressive play that we've seen out of the West Central Heat to this point uh, in the season. And uh, that's very hard to tell. I mean, obviously, you take a look, as stated, you know, you got Caden Drosty, uh, who's ran for over 2,500 yards. He has over 40 touchdowns on the season. Um, with that, you got Mason Carnes, the quarterback, who's ran for over 800 yards and has over 16 touchdowns on the season. And basically what Coach Kirby does is uh, primarily run more of a, a triple option style offense where you know they're going to line up in somewhat a, of an eye or offset wing or offset eye. Uh, and they're going to either give the ball to Parker Meldrum up the middle um, or they're going to fake it to Meldrum up the middle and then roll out to either the right or left and wait for you to decide what you're going to do. And then they're going to make the play. I, I mean, Mason Carnes does a great job reading what the defense wants to do, um, a, as well as uh, Kane Drosty does a great job trailing him uh, and, and patiently waiting for the pitch. And I, I think that's one of the biggest things that we've seen out of the heat is their ability to stay patient, pick up their blocks, and then explode from there. And uh, they've done a great job with it defensively. The same thing on defense. We we see them uh, be able to attack the edge rather quickly. They're, pre they're pretty good in pass defense as well because they have uh, some good team speed. They're very good at changing up their tendencies and looks based off of what the offense is giving them. Um, so, you know, you, you have that working to your uh, benefit uh, when you're a well-coached team, which obviously Coach Kirby uh, does a great job with the Heat, um, very renowned in his coaching abilities as well. So um, with this, you know, I do have West Central as the favorite. Um, they come in as a 12-point favorite in this game. I have them winning this game 54-38 to to move on to the semifinals. All right, we move over to 11-man, and our first matchup is going to take us to Dakota, where the Indians enter this game with a 6-4 and four record. They are going to play host to Marquette, who enters the game with a 9-1 and one record. Marquette got here by way of beating Morrison 20-8. to eight. Dakota beat Iroquois West in comeback fashion 16-14 to 14 to set this matchup up. Um, taking a look at... Uh, both teams here, um, Marquette has played uh, five playoff opponents going 4-1 uh, on the year. They were 3-1 and one against playoff opponents in the regular season. Their only loss coming to Chicago Hope, uh, who is ranked number three in the AP poll. And the Crusaders have outscored their opponents on average 29-17. On the other side is, are the Indians, who have gone two a, two and three against playoff opponents, one and three in the regular season. That lone win coming against the Force and Cardinals when they upset them back in Week Four. Um, with that, Dakota 
uh, is on the negative side of the scoring parameters against playoff opponents in the regular season, uh, averaging 26 points per game against playoff opponents while allowing 43 points per game uh, against those same opponents. So that's a negative 17-point differential for the Indians uh, compared to a plus 7 for Marquette. Uh, taking a look at, uh, obviously, some key playmakers for the Indians. Um, we're looking at Adrian Ariano, uh, has over 725 yards rushing, has over seven touchdowns. Tommy Bowman also has over 500 yards rushing from his fullback position. So Dakota is going to have a combination of run-pass mix. Um, obviously, their QB is uh, Caden Niedemeyer, and um, he himself has set uh, new records uh this season for most passing touchdowns uh, in the regular season, or in, in a season, I should say. Um, he's thrown for over 1,200 yards on the season, uh, has completed right around 55% of his passes, and his leading target is Adrian Ariano as well. So Ariano getting it done through the air, on the ground, and uh, leads the Indians with over 600 yards receiving, uh, over 10 touchdowns. His second leading target is Tug Dornick, who has um, over 370 yards receiving as well. So um, the Indians are pretty well balanced. Obviously, uh, there's there's still concerns with um, how they can uh, make their their plays more formidable. Um, they definitely have to get uh, better protection up front on pass plays. They have to be able to fire off the line. Marquette's got a pretty decent sized line, um, and they continue to have grown over the course of the season as far as physical play. And uh, obviously, they're here for a reason. They're they're good, um, and they have good playmakers with uh, Journey Reed. Um, you got. Uh, um, their quarterback, um, Graham, and then you, you got Durden at running back as well. And then there's another running back in there for the Crusaders that definitely helps uh, this offense move. And, um, you know, you, you take a look at uh, what Marquette can do. You know, they're going to run a wing-style offense. That's a staple of Coach Yupst. Um, at the same time that they will do, uh, the normal things that you see in, in a pass game out of the, out of the, uh, wing style offense. And, you know, you're going to see bootlegs, uh, you're going to see tight end delays. You're going to see drag routes. Um, and, and then you're going to see the typical, give it to the fullback misdirection, uh, buck sweep, stuff like that. So um, Dakota's going to have to be able to be ready to go. Um, you know, you're going to have to play sound fundamental defense, play assignments in order to have a chance in this game. Um, taking a look at the favorite, Marquette is a touchdown favorite in this game. Um, taking a look at point differentials, opponents, and everything else, I have Marquette as a 14 point winner uh winning this game 36 to 22 next game is going to take us to lena winslow where the number one ranked panthers come in at 10 and 0 they are going to play host to rova williamsfield as the cougars are six and four on the season rova williamsfield beat stark county 28 to 14 in a rematch game of conference foes uh, to get to this uh, inviting matchup with the number one ranked and two-time defending state champion Lena Winslow Panthers as they beat Chicago Richards 48 to six. As stated before, you know Lena Winslow won this game 48 to six. They were up 34 to nothing in the first quarter. Uh, at the half, teams uh, met and they agreed to eight-minute quarters, continuous running clock. Um, which the running clock, I believe, started in the second quarter. Uh, from reports that I heard. Uh, either way, it definitely sped up the course of this game, um, limiting the ability for Lena Winslow to really get many yards or stats, for that matter. 
Um, I was actually asked, did Lena Wenzel only get 110 yards of total offense? Yes, they did. I mean, when each of your three running backs gets one carry and they all score, and then you have a kickoff return for a touchdown, a, um, you tend to score pretty fast and uh, very quickly, and then it's lights out and game's over. So um, that's what we saw the Panthers. Um, obviously, uh, for uh, Lena Winslow, you know, you're taking a look at the um, running abilities of uh, Gage Dunker, uh, Gunnar Lobdell, and Jake Zeal. On the season, Lobdell has eclipsed the 1,000-yard mark with 1,051 yards and 15 touchdowns. Dunker is right there with 974 yards and 22 touchdowns. And Zeal's not too far behind either, as he has 753 yards rushing and 10 touchdowns. Um, obviously, all three of these running backs were just recently announced as all-conference team members. Uh, in running back positions with both Lobdell and Dunker getting first team and Zeal getting second team. On the defensive side of the ball, uh, you know, Dunker plays the end. Uh, Zeal plays kind of like a, a strong safety uh, or cornerback position uh, or safety position, and uh, Lobdell plays linebacker. Lobdell was just named Defensive Player of the Year for the conference. Uh, so he's been making big plays on both sides of the ball. Definitely had a slow start to the season, has come on strong. Obviously, the Panthers didn't have uh, very many hiccups in this or, or with this issue as they continue to rack up points at a very great pace um, where they are averaging uh, right around uh, 50 points per game. Currently, uh, they've scored 504 points through 10 games so far. Uh, and, and still very much, if they can keep up that scoring uh, rate, are very much in contention for, for, for being one of the highest scoring teams that we've seen in IHSA history. So um, obviously we got two other teams that are definitely doing that as well and other classifications with both uh, Princeton and Reed Custer doing uh, the same thing that Lena Winslow has been doing uh, all season long. So, you know, this game uh, looks like fun on paper, but really it's not. Um, you take a look at uh, Rova Williams Field uh, against playoff opponents on the season. They are three and four. Um, they have a negative scoring differential, averaging 29 points per game while allowing 36 points per game. On the other side against playoff opponents, Lena Winslow averages 44 points per game while allowing 22 points per game. Some of that is uh, a little bit uh, deterred as they have had uh, much larger uh, games uh, with scoring differentials uh, than what the final score resulted that kind of skews that number a little bit, but uh, a plus 22 point differential there, uh, five and zero against playoff opponents as expected, especially since they are undefeated. Um, due to the strength of schedule differences, I did put a little bit of uh, multiplier in effect on my final score predictions and outcomes because of the scoring differentials. Uh, but Lena Winslow does come into this game as a 52-point favorite. I have them walking out of this game as a winner, 60-17. to 17. Our next game is going to take us to Forreston, where the Cardinals enter with a 6-4 record, and they are going to entertain Chicago Hope, who comes in with a 10-0 record. Hope beat Corliss 69-0, and Forreston beat St. Bede 46-22. Taking a look at what Forreston has, you're, you're looking at the run game of Johnny Kobler. Uh, Kobler has eclipsed 1,100 yards uh, on the year. Currently seeing at 1,103 yards rushing with 18 touchdowns. With that, you have the play of Caleb Sanders right behind him at 792 yards and 10 touchdowns. And then uh, uh, some other guys that are starting to get more carries. McKeon Crace 
uh, Quentin Frederick, who just returned back to the lineup from injury, and then quarterback Brock Smith all sit right around that 300-yard mark uh, with some touchdowns uh, apiece in there. But really the biggest playmakers are Sanders and Kobler. Um, Forrest mix it up, mixes it up both with speed and power. Uh, Kobler is a big boy going about 6'2", 220, uh, running up the middle. Kind of reminds you of that uh, old Garrett Bodicher type uh, uh, running back. And, um, you know, with Quentin Frederick back, it gives uh, the Cardinals another threat and option as well. Um, but the Cardinals keep churning away as they continue to get stronger as the year goes on. Um, obviously, they're one of the teams that I've been talking a lot about here recently. And I been getting a lot of uh, static from people on, you know, how can you say that Forreston is this and that when they haven't proved it yet? Well, they have and they haven't. Um, Forreston has been one of those Jekyll and Hyde teams that we definitely anticipated being uh, a team to reckon with as the season has uh, gone on. At the same time, you know, we, we've seen sparks of what Forreston can do. Um, and you take a look at where the Cardinals have been for the past uh, two to three weeks. <clears throat> and you are definitely starting to see uh, the wings spread out and the Cardinals taking flight. And um, if... If you really need to take a look, all you got to do is look at week nine and take a look at their game with Lena Winslow. Granted, I do feel that Lena Winslow played more conservative in that game. They were platoon subbing in that second half, um, obviously trying to keep players healthy, keep legs fresh, not too worried about the outcome of the overall score of the game as they had a comfortable lead in that game. Um, and, and, and not only that, but when you take a look at these two teams, they have a long history of meeting each other back in the playoffs. And, uh, with that, you, you don't want to show too much. Obviously both these teams know exactly what each other want to do and what they're going to do. Neither one of them really change it up a whole lot, but you never want to show your entire stack if you don't have to, even when if you know how familiar you are with each team. And with that, though, uh, Forreston did uh, play very physical in that game. They put themselves in position in that game to uh, have opportunities, which they did not capitalize on. But at the same token, when you can go up against the two-time defending state champs who have been basically running amok with everybody throughout the course of the season, you have just put yourself in the conversation of where we thought that Forreston would be. And uh, they're definitely uh, playing to that level. Obviously, they've been hit with uh, the injury bug. They've been hit with the fumble bug. Uh, they've had a lot of special team miscues that have cost them games. I mean, I, I said it last week or a couple weeks ago, Forreston is simply – about six minutes away from being an eight and one team instead of a six and four team. And uh, you, you can say what you want, but at some point you can take a look at how they've gone up against other opponents. And then you have to do the eye test. And the eye test tells you that you can see that they have size, they have speed and they play physical. And teams that do that tend to have more success when you get to the playoffs. Chicago Hope, obviously, is going to be led by uh, Judah Millette. Um, I can't remember the quarterback's name, but he throws a very good ball. Uh, they're going to try to utilize speed. They, they run a four-wide set, single back option. At times, they're going to go into a pistol eye formation where they're basically going to give that uh, pistol eye back the ball on a simple lead or dive. Uh, but they want to utilize speed in open space. Um, they, they do like to go vertical. Uh, they will do some uh, dump routes as well across the middle. 
to open up space underneath uh, and, and utilize speed there. Um, obviously, Hope's going to have uh, the advantage when it comes to speed. Um, likewise, I think Forston's going to be the stronger team up front. Um, and in this game, for them to have success, they're, they're going to have to be able to uh, take control of the line of scrimmage, both offensively and defensively. If they don't do that, um, they're, they're going to run into some problems. At the same time, we have to see uh, a forced in team that stays uh, true to itself, and that is playing disciplined football, setting the edge, attacking the ball, playing assignment defense. Um, if they start chasing, they're going to find themselves getting in trouble because, like I said, they just don't have the speed to match up with some of these guys. Um, I wouldn't be surprised to see Forreston come out in a 4-3 defense and then kind of uh, work their way into more of a nickel defense uh, with an umbrella scheme, maybe a cover three, cover two. Maybe they'll even go cover four. Who knows? Uh, but um, they – that they're definitely going to have to get pressure on the quarterback if they can get pressure on the quarterback. Uh, I don't think you'll see the speed matter as much because um, with pressure comes the ability to make more mistakes and uh, force. And like I said, they just have to play sound fundamentally and they'll be fine. Um, taking a look, Hope has played uh, three playoff opponents on the season. so. Um, they've outscored those opponents 36 to 20 for a 16 point differential in their favor. Forston has played five teams that have made the playoffs going two and three against those opponents. They have been on the negative side of the points in those games, uh, averaging 24 points per game while allowing 32 points per game. Uh, Hope is going to come in as a uh, two point favorite, but I, based off of strength of schedule, um, I did make some adjustments to the point differential, and uh, I do have Forreston as the favorite in this game. They are my pick to win 34-23. to 23. Another interesting matchup takes us over to Rockford, where the Lutheran Crusaders come in at 6-4 and four out of the Big Northern Conference, and they will play host to the Fulton Steamers, who enter this game at 8-2. Last week, Fulton beat Aurora Christian 38-13 to to put a punctuation on four straight playoff defeats by NUIC opponents over Aurora Christian. Rockford Lutheran uh, comes out with an upset win, if you want to call it an upset win. Seating-wise, it was, but I don't know if it was truly. Uh, they beat Anawan Weathersfield 35-19. to um, Obviously, Fulton is going to be led uh, by several playmakers on the offensive and defensive sides of the ball. In the rushing game, you have Lucas Schroeder and Ryan Eads. Both guys have uh, rushed for right around 600 yards. Combined, they have put up 20 touchdowns on the board. Um, and then you also have uh, the backup running of Joel Ford, who has done a great job uh, when he gets in there as well, putting up right around 300 yards and five touchdowns. On the uh, receiving side of the ball, uh, you definitely have to take a look at big-time playmaker and receiver Balin Damoff as he has put up a uh, conference-leading 600 yards uh, of offense with nine touchdowns on 44 receptions. Uh, Ryan Eads has added another 346 yards receiving with four touchdowns as well. And then you got the... Uh, playmaking ability of quarterback Braden Dykstra, who was just named first team all conference. He has passed for a conference leading 1,330 yards with 16 touchdowns on the year, completing 60% of his passes. So um, his pass efficiency is definitely through the roof when you take a look at uh, what he's done on the year. Defensively, um, that is definitely the strong suit that we saw uh, coming from the Steamers as they entered uh, the 2022 season. Uh, that's where they had a lot of their biggest playmakers back. They're led by Joel Ford and Zane Panel, along with Connor Sheridan and Ben Fosdick. So these guys are definitely uh, making, making names for themselves. 
raking hay, uh, getting after it defensively. Um, you know, three of these guys have over 100 tackles on the season. Uh, panel has uh, six fumble recoveries. Fosdick has four interceptions, um, as does, uh, or no, Fosdick's got three interceptions. Sheridan's got four interceptions. Um, Eads has five interceptions. Uh, so these guys get after it. Um, um, they, they, they stay low uh, to the, they play physical, they play fast. Um, you know, at times they're, they're big, but they're not very big. Um, but they play bigger than what they appear. Um, I like the way that Fulton plays. Obviously, you got a team that we originally picked to be five and four, and rightfully so, based off of what you saw them losing on the year uh, from last season. Um, and then you take a look at what they've done with their body of work, and they've they've they got a big win over Dupac. Obviously, they beat Dakota. Um, they they had to make a comeback win over Forreston. They had a low. They had a close loss to Muskegon Catholic Central. That is a very good Division Six or Class Three A team out of Michigan, and and, and then they uh, gave Lena Winslow a, a very good battle and a good test uh, back in Week Five as well. So um, Fulton's definitely loaded. Obviously Rockford Lutheran. I don't know the name of a lot of their kids. Um, but I do know that they uh, have good size up front. They have a great speed in the backfield. Quarterback King Hughes is definitely uh, a guy that can uh, make some big plays. Um, you know, they got a couple. They have one kid that's a, a freshman who has been uh, very explosive, to say the least. Uh, but. I think one of the things that we can see Rockford Lutheran doing is they tend to lack consistency um, based off of stats, uh, taking a look at um, final results, the competition that they played. They, they do show that they tend to struggle against power run teams um, at the same time. Um, Discipline can also become a factor as well. Uh, so I think, you know, this is an, a very intriguing matchup. I think that uh, uh, Fulton's going to come in as a 17-point favorite in this game. Uh, I do think this game may be closer than what that uh, differential projection is. But I do still think... When you take a look at what both these teams have done, Fulton has gone four and two against playoff opponents, uh, averaging 29 points per game while allowing 27 points per game. Rockford Lutheran has gone two and three against playoff opponents. They've only averaged 16 points per game while allowing 28 points per game. With that, um, my pick to win this game is Fulton. I do think it'll be a closer score than what the projection is. But I have Fulton winning 29 to 21. All right, our last game takes us to Braidwood, where the Reed Custer Comets come in at 10 and 0, and they are going to play host to Dupec, who enters this game at 8 and 2. Uh, Dupec gets here by way of win over Catalyst Maria, 52 to 8, and Reed Custer also beat a CPL team in Chicago Carver, 77 to 24. Uh, in this game, Reed Custer is a 14-point favorite. Um, but let's take a look and break some things down. Obviously, the Rivermen are led by all-conference selection member A.J. Mulcahy, who has rushed for just under 1,300 yards and 23 touchdowns on the season. He's been joined by uh, Jalen Naud, who has added just under 450 yards and three touchdowns on the season as well. And quarterback Cooper Hoffman has pitched in on the ground with uh, just under 350 yards rushing. Um, on the other side, or not the other side, but on the passing side of the ball, 
Um, you know, Cooper Hoffman has thrown for uh, 926 yards and 13 touchdowns, only five interceptions, with a completion percentage of uh, 68%. So, uh, Hunter, that's a better completion percentage than you had your sophomore year. <laughs> Just kidding, man. Uh, no, it really is, but. Uh, Obviously, you two are two different style quarterbacks, but uh, Cooper is doing a great job for uh, the Rivermen and leading them in the direction that they're going. Um, likewise, on the uh, receiving side of the ball, Will Howard has picked up uh, 407 yards through the air with six touchdowns. Uh, and uh, you got Jackson Diedrich, who's really starting to come on. He's grabbed nine balls for 138 yards and three touchdowns and uh drew williams uh has really stood out a lot this year too 239 yards through the air two touchdowns on 27 receptions so um obviously dupec wants to run the ball first uh pass the ball second they probably go about a 60 40 70 30 split they obviously like to run out of the spread offense um reed custer they were a four-point loss. They had a four-point loss to Byron last year in the quarterfinals, 28-24. to um, Their other loss also was to uh, Wilmington, who went on to win the Class 2A state championship a year ago. Um, very young team. Uh, obviously gained a lot of experience, and they've shown that this year as they are literally knocking the socks off of everybody they play. Um, they're averaging over 60 points per game against playoff opponents. This is just playoff opponents. They are averaging 51 points per game and allowing just five points per game for a 46 point differential per game. Um, obviously, they are 5 and 0 against uh, playoff opponents. On the other side are the Rivermen. They have averaged 28 points per game while allowing 26 points per game against uh, regular season playoff opponents. Their record is 4-2 and two against playoff opponents. Um, so while it shows that Reed Custer comes into this game as 14-point favorites, taking a look at how Reed Custer has uh, dismantled their opponents, um, obviously their strength of schedule uh, does not read to the level that Dupex does. But when you take a look at the actual competition that they have played, um, especially with a team like Wilmington, who has pretty much owned Reed Custer for the last 40, 50 years, I had to throw a multiplier in this one. And um, I have Reed Custer winning this game by a much larger margin than what the point projection has them favored to win by. Um, and, and it's going to fall more in par with what they truly are scoring and allowing against playoff opponents. And um, I do have Reed Custer win this game 52-12. to 12. Um, Hopefully, you know, Dupac can keep this a much closer game. Uh, obviously, ball control is going to be a huge aspect for the Rivermen to do that. They're going to have to limit mistakes um, offensively and defensively. Uh, and they're going to have to come ready to play because this Comet team is definitely a team that is on a mission. Um, they are my pick to win state. I do have them uh, beating IC Catholic in what many see would be an upset, but in my opinion, I feel that Reed Custer is the favorite at this point in time to get to uh, Champaign. Obviously, the AP polls have them ranked number two. Our NUIC football.com poll had them ranked number one. Um, so I'm not the only one uh, that feels that Reed Custer is a legitimate opponent here. So um, big game for Dupec. Um, I don't see them coming out with this one. Uh, but you got to play the game. And, uh, you know, I can sit here and project things however I want. Uh, I don't have to go play the game. and. Uh, you use it as motivation, use it as fuel, but uh, uh, at the end of the day, you got to go out there and you got to fight, and that's what we got to see Dupec do this week. 
Well, that gives you a look at what we see in round two for the IHSA uh, playoffs for our NUIC teams, along with the quarterfinal matchups for our eight-man teams. Um, obviously, there's there's some very good games out there uh, that some are rematches, um, some were blowouts, some have a little bit more intrigue, first-time matchups. Um, but it will be interesting to see how some of these games play out. Obviously, we got some highly ranked teams going up against each other as expected, uh, both in the eight-man and the 11-man games. Um, and uh, it, it should be a very interesting uh, second week of playoff season. So get out to the games. Cheer for your teams. If you don't have a cheer team to cheer for, get out to a game of a conference member. And as always, root for the NUIC.